This is part two of a video on um, trying to gain some insight on when to use conservation laws, when to use work energy theorem, when to use momentum impulse. Uh, so what we've done so far is we have looked at this problem, uh, and I found the speed of this crate that was initially compressing a spring at point A, and now I found it at point B. And what that looks like is this expression here. It's not pretty, but here you have it. This is the expression, and remember, this part of the, this part of the equation uh, came from my v initial, which was the v I found at point A. So, in the first part of the problem, which includes this area, I, my final velocity is my v at A, right? When I when I substitute in everything, that's my final velocity. But then, when I move to the next part of the problem, this part of the problem then my final velocity for the first part is now my initial velocity for the second part. That is, v at a now, instead of being a final velocity, becomes an initial velocity. Get rid of those lines, go back over here, which is where this part comes from. Uh, the square root of that expression was my v at a. And remember, this delta x is the compression distance of my spring. This is originally uh, what I had as the spring compression distance. And this... Um, this came out of a, a consideration of energy uh, due to the spring. So don't get that confused. That is a very specific delta x. It's not a variable. That is a delta x of the spring, uh, the original compression distance. Let me clean this up just a little bit. So now the next part of this, I'm going to be asked for the height at C. That is, as this thing moves down the track, goes across the frictional portion, it will start to move up the track, it will come to a point uh, a point at height h where it comes to rest, and I'm being asked to find that. So I'm going to go through. The, I'm going to ask myself the same questions. In this part of the problem, are there any forces that are going to bleed energy out of the system? And the answer is is no. Now let me say you could work this as a work energy theorem using the work done by gravity, but I don't think that's the easiest way to go. You feel free to do it. Uh, it's instructive to do, but I think because I don't have any frictional forces, I don't have any drag forces, I much prefer to use a conservation of energy here. So I'm looking for the part of the motion right here, how high it goes up. And so I'm going to use conservation of energy. And what that looks like, just like I did before, let me go to a new page, is that uh, my initial kinetic energy plus any spring potential energy plus any gravitational potential energy. These are all initial values. Um, sorry, that should me it's gravity. These are initials equals um, kinetic energy final plus potential energy of a spring final plus potential energy gravity final. Now I've included potential energy of the spring just because we had it in our first equation. If you look clearly in this section of the motion, there is no spring. So you don't have to include that if you don't want to. I'm just going to be complete and include it, but if you don't want to, I encourage you not to. It'll keep everything cleaner. So at the beginning of this motion, does it have a kinetic energy? And the answer is yes. It's got one half mv initial squared, it's moving, right? Does it have a spring potential energy? No, it does not, that is zero. Does it have gravitational potential energy? Well, because in the first part of the problem I defined my zero point to be where uh, at the level of the track, at b it's still at that level, it's still at that height, it hasn't gained any altitude, so no, there's no gravitational potential either. So I just get, for my initial energy, I just have, it's all kinetic. I have one half mv initial squared. And what is that v initial? Well, that's the v final from the, the last part of the problem. It's this big, ugly, radical thing. Uh, it, but that's what I found is my velocity going into the ramp. And so in my next part of the problem, that becomes my v initial. Now, as it moves up the ramp, of course, it loses kinetic energy. It's going to slow down, and we're looking for how high it goes. But when it stops... So when it stops, the kinetic energy is zero. So this will be zero. The spring, of course, is still zero. But my potential energy, gravity now, is just mgh. Just our good old potential energy of gravity at or near the surface of the Earth. So for my energy considerations, I have this expression. 
Again, I can I can cancel out an M, and what I'm looking for is H. If I divide both sides by G, I get it. H is equal to V initial squared over 2G. And what is my V initial? Well, it's this disgusting thing here. If I square it, I just remove the radical, and what I get is K over M delta X squared uh, minus, I believe it was mu K acceleration due to gravity distance D. And that is over 2G. Let me check and make sure I got that right. Uh, 2, there's a 2 here. Yep. K over M delta X squared minus 2 mu sub K G times the distance D over 2G. And that is what I get is my height. So it's not pretty, but it's not hard. It, you have to do some bookkeeping, keeping up with all the terms. But if you understand when to use conservation of energy, when to use work energy, it's not that bad. So let's just summarize that really quickly. Let's go back and look at our problem. In the first part of the motion, I have no forces that are going to bleed energy out of the system, so I immediately think conservation of energy. In the second part, I do have a dissipative force. I have friction that's going to bleed energy out of the system. It's going to slow things down. So I think, ah, I'm going to have to use work energy. In the last part of the problem, I again have no forces I have no, or that are going to bleed energy out. I have no friction. I have no air resistance. So I immediately think I can probably use conservation of energy here too. And I formulated this problem in the terms of work and energy. You can do the same thing with momentum and impulse. If you have dissipative forces that are going to slow something down or speed it up, uh, that, you, that are going to bleed momentum, or that are going to allow momentum to cross the boundaries of your system, that is to say they're going to apply an impulse. If you've got those forces present, you're probably going to have to use momentum impulse. If you don't, if you can reasonably say that I can define the system so that no momentum is leaving, no momentum is coming in, then you can use a conservation law. Alright, I hope this clears up some confusing.